I want to talk about the hemodynamics of constrictive pericarditis. I have given similar talks in the past, but I'm going to give a lot more new tracings and we will analyze those tracings together as a preparation for boards as well as for uh, real life cases you will encounter. I will start with some questions uh, that will make you think and that I will answer later on in the talk. Which finding on invasive hemodynamics is most diagnostic of constrictive pericarditis? True or false for each of the following five statements. Kuzmol sign is strongly suggestive of constrictive pericarditis. Deep X and deep Y on array tracing are strongly suggestive of constrictive pericarditis. Equalization of end diastolic pressures are strongly suggestive of constrictive pericarditis. Constrictive pericarditis can be diagnosed invasively purely by right heart cath. Constrictive pericarditis can be ruled out invasively purely by right heart cath. This is the clinical scenario in which you suspect constrictive pericarditis and its two main differential diagnoses. A patient presents with heart failure picture, particularly a pronounced right heart failure. It is biventricular failure, but particularly right heart failure with pronounced JVD and JVP elevation and often uh, marked ascites. On echo, there is normal LVEF and no left valvular disease. We tend to think with such presentation that this is heart failure with preserved EF, and that's possible. But in any heart failure with preserved EF, before assuming it's the standard heart failure with preserved EF that is associated with age, obesity, hypertension, or AFib, think of those three major heart failure mimickers and look for their ancillary features. One, a restrictive cardiomyopathy from infiltrative disease with or without RV dilatation, particularly amyloidosis, whether the senile wild type or the genetic younger onset amyloidosis or Fabry or sarcoidosis, or a restrictive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with or without obstruction. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy gives uh, symptoms due to two different processes, the LVOT obstruction and or the severe diastolic dysfunction, the restrictive phenotype. So that's one differential, restrictive cardiomyopathy. The second is constrictive pericarditis, which could be idiopathic frequently, or it could be radiation or post-operative after open heart surgery. Those are the top three form of constrictive pericarditis. And the third differential is isolated or predominant RV failure. And that is the most common one out of the three for that clinical picture. So I will talk about constrictive pericarditis, the pathophysiology and what will help distinguish it from the other two, clinically and invasively. So in constrictive pericarditis, you have a stiff shell which is that pericardium that surrounds the right and left heart chamber. This stiff shell results in three effects that will help you understand the findings. One, it exerts a pressure on those cardiac chambers and forces them to equalize with its own pressure. It compresses them until their pressure equalizes with its own pressure, typically a pressure around 15 to 25 millimeter of mercury. The same thing happens in the other pericardial disorder, which is tamponade. So you compress them until the pressure rises and equalizes with the pericardial pressure. And it forces their pressure to be equal to each other. Eventually, early on, it will compress the chamber with the lowest pressure, as in tamponade. With more severe rise in pericardial pressure, eventually it will compress all chamber and forces all of them to become equal to each other and to that pericardial pressure. So that's one finding, high and equalized diastolic pressures. Number two, you have both the right and left heart are constrained within that shell. They can no longer expand outward. They have to expand at the expense of each other. And this is what we call ventricular interdependence. 
So far, whatever I said does not distinguish the constrictive pericarditis from restriction or isolated right heart failure because you get those exact findings with the other two. With right heart failure, you will get ventricular interdependence. With right heart failure, the right heart is dilated. The issue is the right heart. It's dilated. It stretches out to a point that it stretches the pericardium and the pericardium becomes functionally constrictive. You reach its point of non-compliance. So you end up with eventually ventricular interdependence because the RV will now start to have to expand toward the LV and compress the LV and diastole and force it to equalize its pressure with it in diastole, okay? So you have RV, LV interdependence in RV failure. You have it in restrictive cardiomyopathy, particularly with RV dilatation. So none of what I mentioned so far is specific to constriction. Now, the third is the most important finding. That shell that surrounds the heart prevents the transmission of respiratory pressure to the cardiac chambers. So the respiratory pressure gets transmitted to the other thoracic structure and vascular structure, but not to the cardiac chamber, okay? And that will create what we call dissociation between intracardiac and intrathoracic pressures, okay? And this is the key idea you need to remember. It's ventricular interdependence with a respiratory effect. And that's the thing you don't have in the other two differential diagnoses. I will explain it. In inspiration, you get negative pressure to the pulmonary vein normally, and normally you get it to the left ventricle and LA as well. But in constriction, you don't get that. The lack of transmission of that inspiratory pressure to the cardiac chamber reduces the driving gradient between the pulmonary vein and the LA. And therefore, you'll have less flow between the lungs and the LA, LV in inspiration. And you have less flow that will suck the septum from the RV to the LV in inspiration. Now the right heart will be able to fill more because of that sucking motion. Now, why does the right heart fill more? Because there is this IVC, which is not subject to the inspiratory pressure. Actually, the IVC pressure increases with so inspiration when the diaphragm is pushed down, the abdominal pressure rises. So actually, IVC pressure may rise and you have here a sucking chamber that will suck the flow. So it's the left heart that collapses and sucks the right heart and the IVC flow. Note, you don't suck SVC flow because the SVC is subject to negative respiratory pressure and inspiration. So the flow initially will tend to decline between SVC and RA. Because this is negative, this is no transmission of pressure to the RA. So the, the flow won't, will want to decline. But because it declines, eventually the pressure in the SVC will remain unchanged or even rise, despite the direct negative pressure, just because no blood is flowing down. That's what we call the Kuzmold sign. Kuzmold sign means the RA pressure and the SVC jugular pressure does not decline with inspiration and may in fact rise. Here the RA pressure doesn't decline with inspiration because there is no transmission of direct negative pressure and it may rise because it's sucking blood from the IVC. There is discordance between SVC and IVC. You can actually delineate that via echo of the SVC versus echo of the IVC. So know that discordance between SVC and IVC simply because SVC is in the thorax, IVC is in the abdomen. So that explains why that RVLV interdependence is very subject to the respiratory cycle, which is not the case in RV failure and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Even though some of that may happen in uh, in cardiomyopathy, any normal individual, the flow on the right side increases in inspiration and the flow on the left side increases with expiration. But the change is far less dramatic than you get with constriction because of that dissociation intrathoracic, intracardiac exaggerate that process. And in uh, heart failure and in restrictive cardiomyopathy, you have no stroke volume reserve. So even if you want to increase your right heart flow 
and inspiration. It's not going to increase because you don't get much flow reserve. So those are the hallmark findings in constrictive pericarditis, ventricular interdependence, which, uh, which causes equalization and diastolic RVLV pressure, but more importantly, you have respiratory discordance of that ventricular interdependence, which explains all the specific findings on echo and on cath. And I will show you those. I'll start by the echo findings. So this is an echo of a patient suspicious for constrictive pericarditis. What's the hallmark finding you see on this image here? What's the abnormality? So the big thing before uh, detailing it, you see abnormal septal motion. Now you can dissect it and tell <coughs> what abnormal septal motion you have exactly, but you can tell that septum is not normally behaving. It's a swinging too much in both directions. And this is another image of it. And I'll go back to it. Now, what causes abnormal septal motion? Just think there are three main differential diagnoses. Left bundle branch block, RV failure with severe RV dilatation, and constrictive pericarditis. A fourth one, post-op abnormal septal motion, gives a different abnormality of septal motion. They are very easy to diagnose. Left bundle, you can tell this patient doesn't have left bundle on the EKG. Severe RV failure with RV dilatation. Well, here RV doesn't look big, at least in this view. Okay. So already just Abnormal septal motion with this RV and this EKG, you're highly suspicious of constrictive pericarditis. And if you're more elaborate, you can actually fine tune that abnormal septal motion. And the abnormal septal motion of constrictive pericarditis is special. In RV failure, the abnormal septal motion is the fact that the RV in diastole will push the septum toward the LV which is an abnormality. Okay, normally the septum in diastole will go toward the RV. Look how it is on M mode. And M mode is the best to fine tune and delineate the abnormal septal motion. So in RV volume overload, the septum gets pushed toward the LV. This is your LV here. Your septum gets pushed toward the LV in diastole and gets pushed toward the RV in systole. It becomes at the mercy of the right ventricle. The right ventricle is what's using the septum now. In constrictive pericarditis, the same thing happens, but not between systole and diastole, it's between inspiration and expiration. So in inspiration, the RV expands and the septum gets pushed toward the LV. In expiration, the septum gets pushed toward the RV. So you get septal motion abnormality that is respirophasic, not systole or diastolic, respirophasic. So look at this picture, inspiration, expiration. Look where the septum is. You don't need to analyze systole, diastole, and the EKG in this case. Whereas here, the difference is within the same cardiac cycle between systole and diastole. You... Then there is in constrictive pericarditis, second motion abnormality. So one is respirophasic, the second is what you call septal bounds, which is within the same cardiac cycle. The RV and LV are fighting for space, that, that, so the septum is shuddering between both. And you can see it here. So that septum is shuddering. It's not staying still at any moment in time. You see that? And you can see on this image, the septum is shuddering, but at one point you get a big shift. So it's shuddering, then a respirophasic shift. You see that? A bigger movement in inspiration, push toward the LV. So it's not within the same cardiac cycle, the large movement, it's respirophasic. But you don't even need to know all this. You can just tell <clears throat> by analyzing the basic echo image and the EKG. So, and according to Mayo Clinic, uh, those three features are diagnostic of constrictive pericarditis by echo without even any invasive testing. You need to know respirophasic septal shift on M mode, along with either one of the following. Hepatic vein reverse D to forward D ratio more than 0.8 in expiration and on the same beat, and I will explain that later. And what we call annulus inverses, which means that the E prime velocity is high and it's higher than the lateral E prime. OK, 
okay? So if you have this plus any of those, you made the diagnosis, you don't even need invasive hemodynamics. You can get respiratory variation of E-wave, which is also a finding that suggests that respiratory discordance, but this is not specific. You can get it in any uh, patient who is breathing heavily, any dyspneic patient, COPD patient. So remember those three features, okay? Very easy diagnosis. Now I'll move on to the invasive hemodynamics. So this is what we see in constrictive pericarditis. This is an RA pressure. The first thing you see is a high RA pressure. And the second thing you see is, it's not just high, you have deep X and deep Y descent. So this is A, X, V, Y, you get deep Y and deep X, particularly deep Y, particularly during inspiration, the Y will become deeper. Now, what explains those? It's simply loss of atrial compliance. Mm -hmm. It's a marker of loss of atrial compliance. The atrial pressure shoots quickly up and down. That's why you see that finding in RV failure and restricted cardiomyopathy. It's completely non-specific. It's very sensitive. If you don't have it, it makes you question the diagnosis. Although you, you may not have it in what we call low pressure constrictive pericarditis. So in about five to 10% of constrictive pericarditis, you may not have severely elevated RA pressure. You may have borderline RA pressure without those waveform features, but over 90% will have this. So it's very sensitive, but not specific, okay? The second finding you see on the RA is what we call the Kuzmol sign, meaning that mean RA pressure doesn't change much with respiration. You will see dramatic change in RV, the systolic pressure, yet you won't see much changes in RA pressure. Look, you will see something like that, dramatic RV pressure variation, yet the RA pressure doesn't change much. Again, the Kuzmol sign is not specific. You may very well see it in RV failure, including acute MIRV failure, and you may see it in restrictive cardiomyopathy. And actually, I would say by far, in my experience, the most common cause of Kuzmol sign is RV failure, okay? The explanation is different. The mechanism of Kuzmol sign and RV failure is different than the mechanism in constrictive pericarditis. In constrictive pericarditis, the mechanism is a lack of transmission of that negative pressure to the RA. Okay, combined with the fact that IVC flow to the RA arises. In uh, right heart failure, the mechanism is the fact that the RA compliance is overwhelmed. So for example, in inspiration, the, you have direct inspiratory pressure to that RA. The RA pressure in us should decline with inspiration because of that direct effect. However, with inspiration, the RA filling will rise, and since it will rise in a very non-compliant RA, the RA pressure will shoot up in a way to counteract the direct negative effect of respiration. So that's why in RV failure, the RA pressure doesn't decline in inspiration. It wants to shoot up, and it counterbalances the direct inspiratory pressure. So anyway, not specific. Sensitive, not specific. This is another finding in constrictive pericarditis. One is what we call the dip plateau of the RV, which is kind of similar to the Y descent on the RA, meaning the RV is surrounding by that stiff shell, so it's very non-compliant in diastole. So the moment it gets any filling in early diastole from the RA, it shoots up. This is what we call the dip plateau, or also it's called a rapid filling wave over seven millimeter of mercury. That filling wave here is over seven millimeter of mercury. Again, sensitive, not specific. You see it in any overwhelmed, non-compliant right ventricle. Another finding that you see is a high RV diastolic pressure. But importantly, RV systolic pressure usually, and PA systolic pressure, usually are not very high. They are less than 55 millimeter of mercury. And that's an important finding that may be exceeded in the other entities, okay? In restrictive cardiomyopathy, you frequently have RV and PA systolic pressure more than 55, particularly when they are decompensated. In constrictive, 
you don't get severe pulmonary hypertension. The reason is you're very underfilled. You know, you have very reduced stroke volume. You have underfilled from that right heart constriction that you don't get that high PA pressure. Also, the left heart is not failing severely to cause a high postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. So much so that you end up with this high RV diastolic pressure, low RV systolic pressure, and the ratio of RV and diastolic pressure to RV systolic pressure more than a third. Very sensitive, not specific at all. Why? Because guess what? In restrictive cardiomyopathy, at one point you have severe pulmonary hypertension. But eventually when the RV severely fails, it's not going to be able to generate cardiac output. So that exact tracing can be seen in any heart failure on the right and on the left. It's a collapsing rectangle. The diastolic pressure rises, the systolic pressure drops. Progressively so until you reach the PEA arrest where the RV systole and RV diastole meet. Okay, so this recording is very sensitive for constriction. You need to have it. High RV diastolic, low RV systolic, ratio diastole, systole over a third, but it's not specific at all. You see it in RV failure, you see it in restrictive cardiomyopathy. But in the other two, especially restrictive cardiomyopathy, that can be all the way up the systolic pressure, okay? And the more severe your constriction and the more severe any myocardial process, the more you'll have that morphology, high diastole, low systole, okay? Actually on the LV side, when I see that, when I do my LV recording, if I see tracing like this, and I want to do a complex PCI, that pushes me to do hemodynamic support, that collapsing rectangle. Look at that RV. This is a more advanced constrictive pericarditis. This is RV. It's a rectangular ventricular pressure. But look how high the RV diastolic pressure is and how low the RV static pressure is. This patient had a super low cardiac output of one 1.2 liter per minute. But again, it could be severe RV failure. One thing on this tracing that argue against just RV failure is when you have severe RV failure with a collapsing ventricular tracing, you have no stroke volume reserve. You don't get respiratory variability. The fact that you get a lot of respiratory variability is actually suggestive of a process that is subject to a respiratory effect, such as constriction or tamponade. You got it? So already this tracing is strongly suggestive. Again, still not very specific. And these are the criteria as I described. So the Kuzmol sign, the rapid filling wave, more or less seven, systolic pressure less than 55, and RV and diastolic to RV systolic pressure more than a third. Those are very sensitive, all over 90%, meaning if you don't have them, it's unlikely you have constriction. It doesn't fully rule it out, but it makes it very unlikely that you have constriction. But they are extremely non-specific. Less than 50% specificity is nothing. And regarding that equalization of end diastolic pressure, that is completely insensitive and non-specific. Meaning you can have constriction without equalization of end diastolic pressure, depending on the stage. Maybe not all four chambers are compressed by that constrictive shell early on if the constrictive shell pressure is not high. And if you have underlying LV diastolic dysfunction, for example. So equalization of end diastolic pressure is completely insensitive and non-specific. It's an indicator of an abnormality, but it tells you nothing about the cause of this abnormality. So when I'm doing a right heart cath, if I don't have those, especially if I'm missing several of them, I would say this patient, it's very unlikely that he has constrictive pericarditis. I don't even need to do potentially a left heart cath. But if I have them, like I said, it means nothing. Now, if I have them, how do I prove constrictive pericarditis? This is where I come to the single most important recording. So in answer to that question, the single most important recording in constrictive pericarditis diagnosis is LV-RV simultaneous pressure recording. 
and RV LV interdependence with respiratory effect has a hundred percent sensitivity and almost a hundred percent specificity. That's how important that finding is. And that's what I will spend the rest of my time elaborating on. You need to be familiar with that paper from Jack, a landmark paper that established that sensitivity and specificity of LVRV systolic discordance. That's what we call it, RV-LV systolic discordance, which is ventricular interdependence with respiratory effect. This is inspiration. This is the RV systolic pressure. You look at systole for that finding. This is the RV systolic pressure in inspiration. This is the LV systolic pressure in inspiration. And this is expiration. And what happens in inspiration, the RV systolic pressure will go up while the LV systolic pressure will go down. That's what we call the RV LV systolic discordance. Why systolic pressure? Because systolic pressure correlates with the flow. The diastolic pressure correlates with the pressure of that shell with compliance diastolic pressures. Systolic pressures and pulse pressures correlate with the flow. Okay, like I showed you with that collapsing rectangle, that's the flow. So aside from analyzing every ventricle by itself, analyze how they behave opposite to each other. Okay, and it has all to do with that picture I explained. In inspiration, LV flow declines and therefore the LV pulse pressure declines, whereas the RV pulse pressure will rise. So they behave in opposite direction, okay? Whereas in restrictive uh, cardiomyopathy, in RV failure, and in normal individuals, they behave concordantly. Go down in inspiration and go up in expiration concordantly. This is an easy picture. You will have it on your board, 100%. Real life, I'll tell you, in my experience, interventional cardiologists, not fellows, interventional cardiologists misdiagnose that trace. And I'll show you my personal collection here, okay? Let's start analyzing. Is this constriction or the other processes? Other processes. Why? I, How did you decide? And this is where the error lies. The operator who did this called it concordant. This is discordant, 100% discordant. And here is where the error that people make. They look at peak trends, the trends of the peak. They see here, the LV is going down, RV is going down, LV is going up, RV is going up. I mean, it looks perfectly concordant if you do that. I understand why the operator made the error, but this is the problem. You have to analyze the bulk, the systolic area. This is what the stroke volume is. The flow is the bulk. It's not the systolic peak pressure, it's the bulk, the area under the curve. That is the flow that is discordant or concordant. So you have to analyze the area under the curve, compare the area under the curve in inspiration and expiration. Second, well, what is inspiration? What is expiration? How do you know inspiration versus expiration? Do like they did in that paper. Pick one beat that is inspiratory and one beat that is expiratory and compare both. And how do you know inspiration versus expiration? That can be difficult. There are two ways. Look at the diastolic dips. You see those diastolic dips, okay? The lowest dip is inspiration. The highest dip is expiration. The beat that follows the lowest dip is inspiration. The beat that follows the highest dip is expiration, okay? So you take one inspiratory beat, one expiratory beat, and you compare the bulks of RV, LV, how they are behaving between both. You got it? There is another way of telling inspiration and expiration. With all those conditions, you do tend to get equalization of end diastolic pressure of RV and LV during one part of the respiratory cycle and the separation of RV and LV during another part of the respiratory cycle. 
So one way of telling inspiration and expiration when you have that phenomena is one respiratory cycle is when you have equalization, the most equalization, and one respiratory cycle is where you have the most separation. Okay, so here, here is what I'm going to do. This is the inspiratory beat, mm -hmm. okay? And that may be a better expiratory beat here. So take this expiratory beat and this inspiratory beat. And it's best to take the end expiration. Here, you know, this is inspiration. The dips are going down. This is expiration. So the dips are going up until here. So this is the best expiratory beat. This is the best inspiratory beat, okay? So clearly, I think the bulk here is lower than the bulk there, whereas the bulk here is bigger than the LV bulk. So the LV is going up in bulk, whereas the RV is going down between inspiration and expiration. This is clear cut discordance, in my opinion. You got it? And you can take this inspiratory beat as well. Same thing. Here, the bulk of the RV is going up while the bulk of the LV is going down. So this is clear-cut discordance. When using the wrong technique, you would have called it concordant and mistreated the patient. And here I'm showing inspiratory beats via arrows, expiratory beats. Like I said, you can make a full diagnosis by echo according to the Mayo Clinic analysis. But it's always nice to get more confirmatory finding for one, even if you have the full echo findings. And it's also valuable if your echo is not confirmatory, if you don't have those three features by echo that I showed. How to do LV, RV systolic discordance? Five tips. Record many tracing using quiet and deep breathing. So what I do during those cases, look, you may find one recording where it's not certain. Did the bulk really change between inspiration and expiration? I cannot tell. So the key in those cases is to get long tracing using what we call slow sweep speed. So we get many recording on one page and do many recording. I record for several minutes in those cases. I get a bunch of tracings, then I go back and I analyze them. I search for consistency. Is it really consistent on all those recordings that I'm mainly discordant? Okay, I want to make a diagnosis that will eventually change the management of this patient. Mm -hmm. Constrictive pericarditis is curable, whereas the other ones are managed differently. So get a lot of recordings and analyze them. Take your time. And normally in hemodynamics, we like the patient to be breathing quietly. We don't like respiratory changes during our recording, except in constrictive pericarditis. Why? I want to exaggerate the bulks with respiration. You know, I want to create that respiratory discordance, that respiratory effect on discordance. And how do you exaggerate it? By asking the patient to take deep breath in and out, in and out. And you will make those dips fluctuate more and the bulks fluctuate more. You will create more negative pressure and more septal motion with deep respiration. Granted that deep respiration can occasionally create discordance in patients with severe lung disease and in a morbidly obese patients. Now, another thing I do is compare the peak inspiratory beat, which corresponds to a beat preceded by the lowest diastolic dip, and the peak expiratory beat. And it's important to analyze the systolic area, the bulk of the rectangular pressure, rather than analyze the peak. The area is what corresponds to stroke volume. Now, this is a common situation. If all dips are too deep, what do you do in that case? Sometimes all dips are very low, below the zero line. It's hard to tell what's inspiration, what's expiration. One, you can use, like I said, the diastolic separation, okay? You know, where you have no diastolic separation and end diastolic versus where you have the most diastolic separation. Two, damp your tracing. Aspirate a little blood in your catheters to damp them so they are not under damp and spiky down the dips. So you do that and then you can analyze inspiration versus expiration. Normally, in uh, when we record, we can get something called under damping meaning excessive resonance in your system. So you get overshoot, any dip overshoots, any dip down overshoots, any pressure up overshoots. 
Okay? So you attenuate that with the blood. Another important idea is PVCs. So you can induce PVCs to exaggerate that respiratory effect of discordance. So if you have subtle LVRV discordance, induce a PVC and it will exaggerate it. The well-timed PVC will exaggerate discordance. Why? When you have a PVC, post PVC, you have higher preload, okay? And normally, both ventricles will have a higher stroke volume because they had time to fill more, except in constrictive pericarditis. Because post PVC, the, the two preloads cannot increase concomitantly. If the preload of one increases, it has to increase at the expense of the other one. They cannot both increase because they fight for space because they are constrained by that chain. So that's why after a PVC, you can exaggerate the discordance, except if you have, let's say, very premature PVC, okay? Or let's say two PVCs in a row, multiple short RR cycles. The ventricles are very empty. They haven't filled in a long time. They haven't had much diastole in a long time. So much so that they can be concordant even with constriction. They can be concordant with constriction if they are both super empty after multiple short RR cycles. Which bring me to the point of an irregular rhythm. So while PVC is helpful in the diagnosis of discordance, a completely erratic AFib isn't and can be confusing. Why? Because in completely erratic AFib, you can get, you get multiple short RR cycle followed potentially by a long RR cycle. You can have concordance on the long RR cycle that may counteract any respiratory discordance. So it makes things difficult to analyze. You start getting the effect of the RR cycle, which should be discordant, but maybe concordant because the ventricles are empty after multiple short RR cycle. So it makes it difficult to analyze. So in those cases, what's recommended is to slow down AFib and pace them. Pace them at a faster rate. Let's say their AFib is 90 beats per minute, you pace them at 100, 110 beats per minute to analyze the isolated effect of respiration. Now I'm going to give you more practice. This patient, is it concordant or discordant? This tracing is 100% discordant, yet the operator who did it called it indeterminate. And here's how it is. So we have Peak inspiratory beat is this one. And this is the beat here that follows the lowest dip. And expiration is that one. And you analyze the bulk. This is the RV, it's going dramatically down. And this is the LV. Don't look at the peaks, especially here you have under damping. You have overshoot of that pressure. That's not the true RV systolic pressure. This is under damping. But the bulk is still correct. The area under the curve here and the area under the curve there. The LV is going dramatically up while the RV is going dramatically down. This is massive discordance. Now, furthermore, we have a PVC. We have that regular irregularity. Use it to your advantage. Okay, I got a PVC. Analyze the post-PVC B and compare the pre-PVC to the post-PVC B doesn't matter what respiratory cycle it is. Here, when you're analyzing PVC, you can, you know, remove from your brain inspiration, expiration. Just look, RV, LV before PVC, RV, LV after PVC. After a PVC, RV goes up dramatically, LV goes down dramatically. Okay. Imagine that after a PVC, your pulse pressure will go down after PVC. And here I indicate those beats. More practice cases. So this is a patient presenting with a picture of severe right heart failure. This is his RA pressure. What, what do you see on this RA pressure? So you see Guzmol sign, you have no respiratory variation of the mean RA pressure, and you see deep wide descent, particularly in inspiration. Look, this is expiration, this is inspiration. You have deep X, but especially deep Y descent, okay? Why in inspiration? Because in inspiration, you fill more, 
So the pressure will want to shoot up more. And when it shoots up more, it shoots down more. It's the non-compliance. You shoot up more, then you'll shoot down more. But some people call it the M shape of the RA pressure. Very non-specific. Very high RA pressure. It's very concerning. Whatever disease this patient has, whether constrictive, restriction, RV failure, it's a bad disease when you see this. But it's not diagnostic of the etiology. So we did this RVLV recording. So what's the diagnosis here? So this recording is also definitely discordant. Pick the peak inspiratory beat, that lowest dip, what follows it. This is the inspiration. And peak expiration here. The pressure is rising, then it goes down. This is the peak expiratory beat. So compare that beat to that beat. The RV bulk is definitely going down between those two, between this and that. Whereas the LV bulk, this is going up between those two. Not dramatically up, but it's going up, okay? So this is discordance. And you can analyze again, multiple beats. You can pick another expiratory beat. This is another expiratory beat here. So compare this expiratory beat to this inspiratory beat. Here is expiration and inspiration. So the bulk of the RV going dramatically down while the bulk of the LV going dramatically up. It, that's why I tell you, get multiple recording, long recording, and analyze them quietly. It may not be obvious on some, it will be obvious on other recordings. Another idea that I want to highlight that you don't see, even aside from concordance discordings, a feature that goes with constriction is the fact that you get dramatic bulk changes in general. In restrictive cardiomyopathy and heart failure, you don't have much stroke volume reserve. So the bulks don't change much with the respiration. The fact that you get this versus that, that dramatic change of a ventricular bulk by itself is suggestive of not a myocardial process. Mm -hmm. It's a process where we have stroke volume reserve, therefore constricted pericarditis. And here you have the PVC. Again, the PVC help, we induce it to further confirm. I always try to induce a PVC and compare the bulk here. The RV went up while the LV clearly went down in bulk. Now, more cases. This is another case. This is the RA pressure. This is from my book. Very nice uh, M morphology. Okay, this is a deep Y, deep X, Kuzmol sign, no respiratory variation. Again, not specific. Now, this is the RVLV simultaneous recording. What's the diagnosis here? So pick, start systematically. Pick the inspiratory beat and expiratory beat. Already, one difference between this and the prior recording is that you're not getting much changes in the bulk. So it's difficult to tell concordance discordance. And that by itself suggests it's probably myocardial process without much stroke volume reserve. So that by itself, the lack of much bulk change. That's one. Two, when it's difficult, ask the patient to take deep breath and try to induce a PVC. You will exaggerate concordance or discordance. If I want to pick here, this is expiration. This is here. And this is inspiration. And in this case, the RV goes slightly down. Look at the bulk and the LV goes slightly down. So it's more like a concordance, especially the fact that the bulk is not changing much. When you have discordance, I mean, you get a dramatic change in constriction between respiratory cycle. The lack of dramatic changes by itself is suggestive of myocardial process. But again, the advice here is to obtain longer tracing, deep breath, PVC. How we did longer recordings with deeper breath. And this is what you get potentially. This is end expiration. This is end inspiration, okay? And now you can tell this is a clearly concordant. Expiration, both are high. Inspiration, both are low. You got it? Same here, another expiration. 
So by inducing deep breath, what was questionable became obvious. This is another case shared by one of my prior fellows. He made the correct diagnosis. So what's the diagnosis here? This is peak inspiratory beat, lowest dip. This is the inspiratory beat. And this is the expiratory beat before you start declining again. This is the expiratory beat here. So the RV goes down in expiration while the LV, clearly the LV bulb goes up. And you, pick it, you can pick another cycle to confirm. Always analyze multiple cycles. This is here, peak inspiration, RV, LV. And this is peak expiration. It's less obvious on that comparison that, than on the other one. And here we do again those slow sweep speed, long recording, and multiple recordings. And here you can see those are inspiratory beats, lower dips, this one, that one, and this is the expiratory beat. So clearly, this is the inspiration, and this is the expiration here. And clearly, RV goes down between inspiration and expiration, LV clearly goes up the bulb. And you can reproduce that over and over. Again, this is inspiration here after a low dip. And this is the end of expiration. Okay, this is, so this is peak inspiration is this, lowest dip and this beat. This is peak expiration, highest dip. And this is the beat for it. And clearly this compared to that, you're going down in the RV, going up in the RV. You got it? This is another patient. Is this concordant or discordant? This patient is breathing heavily. You can tell you go from inspiration to expiration very quickly from those swings, okay? This is the lowest dip. This is the highest dip. And then he inspires again, okay? He's breathing very shallow. So this is peak inspiratory beat, and this is peak expiratory beat. And yes, RV is going up slightly, LV is definitely going up. And look, keep analyzing, get, get analyze other recording. This is another case. This is the RA pressure. Again, you see that deep Y, deep X, and the Kuzmo sign, unspecific. And this is one of the toughest cases I've had. You know, I, I had to do a lot of recording, a lot of analysis to make the diagnosis. So what's the diagnosis here? I like to go to the peak. So this is peak expiration. This is a clearly you're ending the cycle here, yes. peak expiration. Then this is peak inspiration here. So compare those two, inspiration to expiration. This is inspiration. The LV went down, the RV. the RV probably went up, not very clearly. That's why you need more recording. So it might be discordant, not very clear, but analyze other signs. And here I'm showing you, this is inspiration, this is expiration, this is inspiration again. And you can see that, yes, there is discordance if you compare the inspiratory beat to that expiratory beat. This is a great expiratory beat where it's more obvious that you have discordance when you compare it to the inspiratory beat. That's why I keep looking at expiratory beats. Regarding the use of respirometer, great question. I suggest against it. That's one of the big errors people make in analyzing constrictive pericarditis. They try to time things to the respirometer. The more you add things for the brain to capture in one instance, the more it will get confused and one more it will be prone to error. Don't use it. Use this, this is easier and more obvious. On the respirometer, it's hard to time the respirometer to the cardiac site, okay? Mm -hmm. It can be more confusing. So don't use the respirometer in my opinion, okay? okay? Actually, don't use respirometer on echo either, and I'll show you. I think you can make the diagnosis by echo and by cath without respirometer. Less things to analyze, easier for your brain to wrap around those things. Does it matter, like, comparing inspiration versus expiration in, like, the same kind of respiratory cycle, like, within a few beats versus, like, one at the beginning of the strip and one at the end? Like, Very does that ever point. change, like, sensitivity? Very good point. You should try to compare within the same respiratory cycle, 
Okay, so you should compare inspiration to next inspiration. Why? Because some things may have changed. Maybe here he's more awake, right. he's more excited. He has more stroke volume because he's more awake. It changes things. But I'm taking it within the same 10 seconds. So I'm not taking it an hour later. So ideally within the same respiratory cycle or within a few respiratory cycles. So to go back to answer my question, which finding is most diagnostic of constrictive pericarditis? It's LVRV simultaneous pressure recording with systolic area bulk analysis. True or false? All of them are false. Kuzmol sign, deep X and deep Y, very sensitive, not specific. Equalization and diastolic pressures. This is the worst. It's non-sensitive, non-specific for constrictive pericarditis. Constrictive pericarditis can be diagnosed fully by a right heart cath. No, because you need LVRV simultaneous recordings. Constrictive pericarditis can be ruled out by a right heart cath. Probably true if you have none of those findings that I described. No Kuzmol, no deep X and Y. Uh, the RV systolic pressure is over 55. The RV diastolic to systolic ratio less than one third. So all those combined will rule out practically constrictive pericarditis. But it's still best to do LBRV simultaneous recording. Go to just a few points here. Discordance may be seen in any patient generating deep respiratory pressure. Discordance by echo or to some degree, less degree by cath. COPD, any severe respiratory depress, severe obesity plus sedation, taking deep breath. Particularly if hypovolemic and preload dependent. You're preload dependent on the steep portion of the starling curve. You take a deep breath, you get bigger preload, you'll get a much bigger stroke volume that may overwhelm the direct negative respiratory pressure on your invasive recordings. So yes, you may get respiratory discordance occasionally in those situations, definitely by echo, more rarely by cath. And by echo, you will have abnormal respiratory septal motion and excessive emitral variation from the deep breath obesity lung disease. So another cause of abnormal septal motion is pronounced respiratory effect in somebody with lung disease, okay? But you have to put it in context. You have RV failure clinically and elevated feeling pressures plus respiratory discordance. Then it's a pericardial process. You got it? It's not just obesity and he has asthma. It's he has RV failure clinically and respiratory discordance. Tamponade is a more acute process. So the clinical presentation is different than constriction clinically. However, tamponade gives you grossly very similar echo and invasive hemodynamic findings in a sense that you do get ventricular interdependence with a respiratory effect, okay? There are two differences between tamponade and constrictive pericarditis. The intrathoracic pressure gets transmitted to the cardiac chambers in tamponade. Okay, because there is water in tamponade. It's not a stiff calcified fibrotic shell. There is water and water allows the transmission of the pressure. So you can get a respiratory variation of mean RA pressure. Another idea, you will have that on board, flat Y in tamponade. I mentioned you get deep Y in constriction and in all the other differential diagnosis, RB failure restriction. But in tamponade, you get flat, Y, FYT, flat Y tamponade. Why? In constriction, you have for an instant in early diastole, you have the possibility for that right ventricle to fill. That's what we call the rapid filling way. It fills, but just for an instant, then it stops filling. Okay, it reaches that plateau very quickly. In tamponade, the ventricle doesn't fill even in early diastole. It's compressed more homogeneously throughout the cardiac cycle. So even in early diastole, the RV doesn't fill well. So you don't get that deep plateau on the RV in tamponade, and you don't get deep Y on the RA pressure. You get flat Y. And actually, in tamponade, you get flat Y. And when we drain them, I re-record the RA pressure and the pericardial pressure. You have normal Y after you drain them. If you get deep Y after you drain them, along with a persistently elevated RA and or pericardial pressure, then you suspect this entity called 
effusive constrictive pericarditis. So if you drain tamponade and your RA pressure gets better, but doesn't normalize, especially doesn't drop more than 50%, or your pericardial pressure doesn't normalize, sometimes not just the pressure remains high, you get deep Y now. This is diagnostic of effusive constrictive pericarditis, okay, meaning the pericardium is uh, inelastic and you have water in it that, that further stretches it and overwhelms it com its compliance. You, you got that flat Y, so you get A, X, V, almost no Y. V to A, almost flat line, okay? On echo, the subtle motion abnormality, you will get that, you will get the respiratory variation of E, you will get the respiratory variation of a hepatic flow. Okay. You're not going to get the annulus inverses. So by cath, those indicates tamponade versus constriction. On echo, the annulus inverses indicates, well, maybe on top of my tamponade, I have constriction. Maybe it's effusive constrictive pericarditis. So hepatic veins. Here is what happens in pericardial processes with hepatic veins. Normally you have S and D below the baseline and A reversal above the baseline. That's the hepatic venous flow. In normal individuals, this is a normal individual, between inspiration and expiration, you don't get dramatic changes, okay? You know, you may get a little bit of extra reversal. You get a little more amplified waveform above the baseline in expiration but not much. In constriction, you get a dramatic reversal with expiration of both S and D. It's predominantly what you get is D reversal, and they try to time it to inspiration versus expiration. I say, forget that, forget the respirometer. All you have to do when you analyze those tracing is look at the waves below the baseline and above the baseline. In normal individuals, you don't get much increase in those waves above the baseline. If in a patient you get a wave above the baseline, regardless what it is, S, D, A, doesn't matter, don't worry about it. You get a wave above the baseline that within the same cardiac cycle exceeds the wave, the forward wave, which is below the baseline. That's very suggestive of constriction. It will be in this case, a reversal of flow in expiration. Okay, because the IVC and the hepatic vein have increased the flow in inspiration, remember, and reduced flow in expiration. So we get backup of flow and pressure in expiration. So, but don't analyze inspiration, expiration, keep it simple. You have something above the baseline that is growing and becoming bigger than below the baseline at one point of the respiratory cycle. You don't care which one. This is constriction. It's different than TR because TR will happen to be every beat. Good. So in TR, you have reversal of S wave, not D, but again, don't worry about SD, but you have reversal of S wave in every cardiac cycle. It may change a little bit, but it's not going to be that dramatic. It will be reversed on every cardiac cycle, slight difference. But in constriction, dramatic changes between cardiac cycle because of the respiratory effect. You got it? So here, this is much bigger than the same beat forward flow. Actually, there is no forward flow on the same beat. Here, this is equal to the forward flow in the same beat, okay? So that's already constriction. More than 0.8, the forward flow is already strongly suggestive of constriction. And the way you memorize it, diastolic reversal expiratory constriction, Dr. Reck. Another idea, ancillary finding, once you diagnose constriction, the surgeon does a CT scan or an MRI, uh, it will help him delineate the anatomy and you know, how extensive the calcification and the fibrosis and how far he needs to do peri pericardiectomy. Although typically you need to do full pericardiectomy for those patients to improve, including the posterior pericardium, which is difficult to remove. But that said, we usually typically obtain a CT or MRI, and you need to know what is a normal pericardial thickness and how you make a diagnosis on CT or MRI. 
Pericardial thickness is considered abnormal when it's three millimeters or above. Sometimes you have calcium. You don't always have calcium. By CT or MRI, you frequently have calcium. You rarely have calcium large enough to be seen on chest X-ray. But by CT or MRI, you frequently have calcium, not always. The important idea I want to mention, though, even though a thick pericardium is what we seek on CT or MRI, you may not have a thick pericardium. 18% on pathologic surgical specimen, 18% of true constrictive pericarditis that improve with pericardiectomy don't have thick pericardium. They just have a very inelastic pericardium, okay? So keep that in mind. The normal pericardial thickness does not rule out constrictive pericarditis. On the other hand, a thick pericardium does not mean you have constrictive pericarditis. You need to have the hemodynamics. Maybe I had a viral pericarditis in the past and I still have thick pericardium, but it's not inelastic, it's still compliant. So thick pericardium doesn't mean constrictive pericarditis. You have to have the hemodynamic features. Another final feature is thick pericardium with severe late gadolinium hyperenhancement of the pericardium itself suggests a reversible inflammatory constrictive pericarditis. And that, why is this important? Up to 17% of constrictive pericarditis, particularly the effusive constrictive pericarditis, are inflammatory constrictive pericarditis, meaning the pericardium is non-compliant because of inflammation and edema. It will resolve once that acute inflammation resolves. Those don't need surgery. And the way you confirm they don't need surgery is that late gadolinium enhancement of the pericardium. Normally, pericardium doesn't enhance with late gadolinium. But when it's inflamed, you have a lot of vascularization and you get late gadolinium in it. You got it? Also said rate and yes, R, although those are less specific. Late gadolinium enhancement of the myocardium suggests fibrosis. Late gadolinium enhancement of the pericardium suggests inflammation. If you have fibrotic pericardium, you do not get gadolinium enhancement of the pericardium because the pericardium is poorly vascularized. Normally, pericardium right. doesn't get, it's poorly vascularized. Yeah. It's not very active, right? It's not physiologically active, so it doesn't need a lot of blood, so it's poorly vascularized. Yeah.